Hello, I'm John David Ebert, and we're continuing along here in our discussion of Jordan Peterson's book, Maps of Meaning. Uh, we're moving on into the next two chapters. One of them is just a small chapter on uh, normal and revolutionary life, and the other one is a larger chapter that looks at the architecture of his triad, the relationship between the unknown, the known, and the exploration process that takes place between, between them, or what he calls in this chapter... Uh, the unexplored, which he will later associate with the great mother, the explored, which he associates with the father, and the exploration process that goes along with translating the realm of the unexplored into the realm of the explored uh, with the hero. Uh, uh, and one of the interesting things about this, I think reading this, none of this is anything new to me. Um, this is all basically a left brain version of Joseph Campbell's book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. The two books make exactly the same points. They're interconvertible into each other. But also, I think in an interesting way, Alain Badiou's book, Being an Event, uh, surprisingly, I think, makes most of the same conclusions as well, but does it in a very complicated way using mathematical set theory and highbrow academic philosophy. So we have three books here uh, that basically say the same thing in three different domains. Uh, with Jordan Peterson's book, we have a very drab, dry uh, psychology textbook, and it reads like a textbook. It's not particularly uh, full of artifice or artistry of any kind whatsoever. Uh, it takes some going. You have to kind of push yourself to, to work your way through it. Um, in the domain of uh, clinical psychology, on the one hand, that realm of discourse, and then uh, with Alain Badiou's being an event where he analyzes the eruption of the novelty into a status quo situation, which becomes a truth event, and one becomes a subject by remaining f faithful and follows through fidelity to that truth event, one becomes a subject. The same thing, the same idea, only he expresses it bizarrely, I think, through mathematical set theory and highbrow academic French uh, post-postmodern uh, philosophy. And then with the Hero with a Thousand Faces, all the same points have been made, uh, although he made them first back in 1949 before either of these guys did with the Hero with a Thousand Faces in the realm of uh, literature and the humanities, drawing strictly on uh, right brain imagistic stuff. So we have a dialogue here between right brain and left brain, but all three books make the same point. It's the same analysis, same analysis of the same set of ideas. The eruption of the new and how humans respond to novelty by conquering it, transforming it into a new system that creates a new paradigm with a new order. All of that. So that's found in all three of these books. Do turn to uh, the Los Angeles poet Michael Aaron Kamen has an excellent uh, synopsis um, on the website called, I think it's called Quora, but you can find the link to it on my Facebook timeline uh, or on my Twitter timeline where he gives a kind of uh, Michael's a poet, and a very great poet, in my opinion, uh, and if you need confirmation of that, all you have to do is check out his spoken word utterances on YouTube, or buy his book, Absences, on Amazon, and read it. It's absolutely excellent. The first hyper-modern poet, I think, uh, in my uh, estimation. And, um, yeah, he translates everything, uh, Jordan Peterson's very left-brain book, into pure right-brain poetic uh, terminology in his wonderful synopsis. And what I want to do is kind of do something that's in between the two, that, that draws on both hemispheres. So check out Michael's uh, synopsis there. I think you'll enjoy it. It's, it's very helpful. So um, <clears throat> Peterson proceeds then by drawing from now from Thomas Kuhn's book, uh, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, uh, which came out, I believe it was back in the 70s or 80s, I, I don't remember the date, where um, he was a philosopher of science. Uh, I think he was out at Berkeley. And uh, he wrote a book in which he had this idea that we have normal science punctuated by revolutionary science. Every so often, an event comes along, and here, it, here again, it's the same set of ideas. Every so a lot, often, an event comes along, such as a, a Newtonian science, uh, a Darwinian revolution, a Copernican revolution, that is an example of revolutionary science that changes the whole game by introducing a brand new paradigm with a new set of signifiers that refer to new signifieds, and the rules now are no longer the same as they were before. Um, so he borrows these terms, uh, normal science versus revolutionary science for this, uh, his transformation of this into psychology, 
in the sense that uh, there's normal life and revolutionary life. And he tells two simple stories to uh, from the right brain to uh, bring this home. Uh, normal life, let's say <clears throat> you're uh, on the way to a meeting. You're in the office. Um, you're used to a certain environment, and it's in a certain way. Your companions in the environment, your peers that you may or may not be in competition with, uh, and you're on your way to a meeting, and you have to get there very quickly. So you have to traverse through a series of obstacles to get there. Uh, you get to the elevator, and it's not working, so you have to take the stairs, past the old lady going up on the stairs. There are a number of small obstacles on the way, but nothing challenging. Uh, no big deal. And then you go into the meeting, and that's basically it. That's normal life. There's nothing uh, revolutionary going on there at all. But suppose he says you come back from the meeting. Uh, you come back and you come back to meet your boss. You meet with your present boss who calls you in, uh, someone maybe you don't like. And she says, uh, we don't want you around here anymore. We don't like how you've been doing things. Uh, we just don't want you here anymore. And she fires you. So now you've been thrust into revolutionary life. Uh, the unknown uh, has entered into your life, novelty, essentially, as Peterson calls it, has now entered into your life, uh, bringing along with it the unknown, which he is going to say is the matrix of all knowledge, actually, bringing along with it the unknown, which you now have to contend with. And your response to this, it could be any number of things. You might go home, be depressed for a while, uh, go into a mode where you're sleeping odd hours, you're depressed, you're not sure what to do, you have to reevaluate your life, generate new goals, uh, come up with a new map, and get started again. So that's the difference between normal life and revolutionary life. And life pretty much it does work this way. You go along for a while until you hit an obstacle, and suddenly you're thrown into a new situation. We're always having to deal with crises in our lives. Um, hopefully not often, but it punctuates our, everyone's lives. Everyone has to deal with crisis. And then so he moves into a chapter now after this where he analyzes his basic triadic structure of the unexplored, the process of exploration, and the explored. Uh, in this video, we'll deal, because there's a lot of data here, we'll deal with uh, the unexplored and uh, the exploration process. Um, so this is basically a process then, this triad that happens, whereby the explorer is always going to translate the unexplored into the domain of the familiar. He's going to venture forth like the hero, let's say Columbus, uh, there's a perfect uh, analogy, Columbus uh, sets forth uh, the status quo situation is a set of these maps, these old worn out medieval maps that he knows are not correct or senses that they're not. Um, he's got an intuition that sends him out on a voyage beyond Okeanos, the world encircling serpent, these maps, at the time, these medieval maps were what was called TNO maps, uh, O for the shape of the earth that they represented. Sometimes it was flat, sometimes not. Um, the intelligentsia knew that it was not flat. They knew it was round. And, um, and the T shape, uh, based on the structure of the three known continents at that time, uh, Africa, Europe, and Asia, divided by the three world rivers, the Nile and the Danube and the into the Mediterranean, for, forms the shape of a T-square, basically. That's what these maps used to represent. Um, so we can think of this sort of two-dimensional mythic worlds encircling serpent surrounding this map, and Columbus venturing forth to cut the serpent in half, break it open, and release the world of three-dimensional perspectival infinite space. And in order to do that, he has to move out beyond where it says on the maps in the hinterlands, here be dragons. Those are the realms that demarcate the known from the unknown. Um, and uh, he has to venture out and translate and conquer the unknown and bring it into the known. Same thing in Heidegger here, interestingly enough, when he sets up in his, on, his essay, uh, on his essay on truth, when he creates this idea of aletheia as the essence of truth, where you're bringing entities into the clearing and you're unconcealing them through the truth of that. The truth process involves unconcealing facets of entities as though they were coming out of this dark region of being, this unknown dark region of being, and they surface like these luminous phantoms up out of that region and unconceal themselves, and they face you and reveal certain facets of themselves to you. But as I have just shown you the palm of my hand and revealed it to you, 
in the same process that I showed you right here, the palm of my hand, I withdrew and concealed the back of my hand. So you don't know what the back of my hand looks like. So the same way when uh, entities unconceal themselves, for every part of themselves that they unconceal in the clearing, other facets of them drop off the radar back into the darkness of being, darkened being. Uh, as, so this is the process of the pulling out and unconcealing of knowledge out of the darkness and bringing it into the realm of the known. Heidegger's uh, equivalent of Peterson's uh, world forum in which uh, the hero event takes place is called the clearing. That's the Heideggerian trans translation of this. Uh, you can transform these guys back and forth, in one into the other. You can't do this if you're an academic because you're stuck in one or the other of these worlds, and you're stuck with the discourse of those worlds, and you think the other worlds are doing something irrelevant or don't matter. Um, but if you're someone like me who's outside all of that, and you can peek into these worlds, then you can begin to develop systems for transforming these ideas back and forth and, and showing their equivalence. Um, so the structure is going to be the unexplored, the exploration process, and uh, translating all of that into the explored. Once again, note the temporal structure there. There's an implicit temporal structure because the unexplored represents future potential possibilities. The unexplored always erupts into a situation, destabilizes it, breaks it down, but it's uh, what the Chinese say is crisis and opportunity. It's a crisis with the opportunity that brings about with it promise for new possibilities. Uh, so it represents the future. The exploration process of the here I'm self going forth is the present mode as it approaches the event horizon. And uh, what is then translated from the realm of the unexplored by this explorer into the explored becomes the past. What is stored up as knowledge and becomes associated with that's the world we conquered. This is the world that Columbus conquered when he went forth, and we drew up all the new maps. We put North America into the maps. Now we have a new domain. This is a new body of knowledge. This is what we know. Until some uh, other irascible hero guy comes along and says, no, this is Newtonian physics uh, that was bound up with all this eventually. Newtonian physics weren't correct. Einstein will come along and say that, no, gravity is not a function of force and mass. It's a function of the curvature of space, how a mass of objects warp the space around them. The space is actually curved. It has nothing to do with force and mass. Uh, and then you have to redraw up all the cosmological maps all over again. This is how knowledge works. This is the basic structure of it. And it works this way not just in the sciences and the humanities, but in basic daily life. And this, I think, is Peterson's point. It's a good one. Uh, basically, everything he says here it's pretty much correct. Uh, as you're reading it, uh, it's pretty concrete. Uh, it translates into the basic experiences of our daily lives in very mundane ways. We encounter this stuff all the time. Um, he's just translating it now into psychological textbook jargon. So then we have, um, so he starts just talking about uh, the unexplored. So the unexplored then is the dark region of being the unexplored is what ruptures into a system uh, that brings with it the possibility of the new. So he says novelty, though, when it comes in, is always ambivalent. It's always twin spiked. There's always the possibility that it introduces, on the one hand, uh, curiosity and hope, possibility, but on the other hand, fear and anxiety uh, about what has been uncategorized, what has not yet been translated into the domain of knowledge. And that activates primordial fears uh, basically, that's the Buddhist fear and desire, the same thing, desire for an object as you move along towards it and stop when fear kicks in and then your action toward it is inhibited. So it's the same thing in Buddhism as fear and desire. And uh, so we have the novel coming in um, and it activates those two kinds of emotions. Um, and then he moves into this uh, discussion of the exploration process. What happens when you're confronted with the novel? Um, before that, though, he gives this little example about the two different kinds of novelty. Uh, in the one kind of novelty, you're in your office and you decide uh, that you're hungry and no one else is around. Let's say you're working late. You decide you're hungry, so you go out, you walk out down the hallway, headed for the elevator, like you always do. Um, and there's a chair in the way and you almost trip over it. So it's an obstacle in your path. 
it's a slight novelty and you move it out of the way and then proceed to the elevator. That's basically a kind of normal novelty, a, a situational novelty of the type that we encounter going to the store uh, every day. But let's say now that my plan to go downstairs to the cafeteria to get food now is blocked by some unforeseen circumstances that thrust me into a very unfamiliar situation. Let's say I approach the elevator, I'm approaching it, uh, I click it, and it's broken. It doesn't work. Well, there's a set of stairs, I know I can take those. And I go to the stairwell, but it's blocked by construction. There's no way to get down. And now I'm up on these floors, uh, and now suddenly fear starts to kick in. You're being slowly thrust from a normal situation that you're familiar with into an unfamiliar one that is now uh, an example of uh, revolutionary novelty now. It's, there's something new that has happened here that has changed the entire environment, whereas the encounter with the chair was something that was an a small obstacle within the environment that had to be removed. In this case now, what you have is a transformation of the entire environment. So the whole environment is changing, and now stress responses begin to kick in in the body. Uh, adrenaline starts going, heart starts pumping. What do you do now? So that's a, the example of the kind of ambivalence that comes about when novelty enters into a situation. Now the exploration process, which is the next subchapter that he moves into, uh, is concerned with brain architecture. And so what he does then is map all of this out onto the actual architecture of the brain. And uh, traditionally, as we know, the brain uh, is made up out of a reptilian brain, a limbic or mammalian brain, and the human or neocortex. He's not concerned with the reptilian brain here, so we toss that aside. It's concerned with regulating heartbeat and breathing and stuff like that. Um, he leaves that aside. He's only concerned here with uh, three other aspects of the brain. The neocortex, which contains all the motor units, and beneath that, the limbic system, which contains the emotional responses, and then in the back of the brain, uh, the sensor unit, which contains the visual, acoustic, and tactile aspects. Um, now, so the thing here about all this is that he says that the neocortex then is associated with planning. It's associated with making decisions. Uh, it's broken down into a motor strip, a premotor strip, and a prefrontal cortex. And all of it is associated with making of plans with the envisioning of goals, um, coming up with uh, desired aims to get to that are different from the present status quo situation that you're in right now. So <clears throat> is the neocortex with its motor functions that gets us in motion toward a goal. So we're moving along in motion toward a goal and we're using the sensory back of the brain, uh, the visual and acoustic and tactile areas to analyze the situation as we go along. Uh, note here, once again, we have a uh, structure of time as past, present, future in the sense that the neocortex is concerned with anticipating developments in the future that it's moving along toward. And hopefully there won't be any obstacles in the way. Uh, and the, the sensor motor is always oriented toward the present. You're taking in sensory phenomena right now all around you through your senses. That's oriented toward the present. But the limbic unit <clears throat> will be oriented toward the past because it has to do with the um, assessment of previously agreeable or disagreeable situations that give you an affective emotional response that are stored up in memory so that you can remember whether you liked the situation before or you didn't. Uh, that's all involved. That's the past. And so that's all involved in the, the limbic uh, unit. So there's a relationship here in the exploration process between uh, the frontal lobe, the neocortex, which sets us in motion toward a goal and is the one that is normally in charge and it's when things are functioning normally um, it inhibits the uh, limbic system which only kicks in when something goes wrong so if something goes wrong with your plans um, a catastrophe or we make a mistake an accident happens suddenly the neocortex is not in charge and the limbic system then kicks in with the amygdala and the hippocampus. They then kick in and begin to uh, what's called kick in an orienting reflex uh, that then sends this dual aspect ambivalence of the novelty that you're confronted with that can kick in the emotional centers that are associated with curiosity on the one hand and anxiety on the other. Those both come in and they weigh against each other 
And uh, so the limbic then kicks in and takes over. After you've lost your job, that emotional aspect of your limbic system is what's taken over now. And you feel all these emotions, depression and fear, and you're worried. All of that stuff then takes place. So <clears throat> the main point here about this, um, we can go into more details about the structure of the brain here. But the main point he's making here is he's basically saying that the brain is not a tabula rasa, uh, as much of the left want to insist to us that it is. It absolutely is not. The, the brain is not a tabula rasa that is strictly uh, like a Babylonian clay tablet with no writing on it that's presented to the king. Here, inscribe me. Uh, the state will inscribe uh, its functions onto me, and I can just as easily wipe them out because uh, they weren't innate to begin with. That's wrong. Um, so I side with the ones who lean more in the direction of the traditional idea that goes back all through philosophy to innate ideas, innate responses. Um, he says that fear, for example, is innate. It is something the response to a new situation is innately one of anxiety, inevitably. And it's the same in animals as it is in humans. If you take a rat and you put the rat in, uh, say the rat has been accustomed to one cage. So it's in an environment that uh, it's got its cognitive map mapped out. Uh, it's safe and comfortable so that it could do normal activities. But you scoop it up and you take it out and put it into a new cage. Its first response is always going to be one of fear. It's in a new environment. Fear is hardwired in the brain. Uh, the brain's not a blank slate. Uh, these reactions are, are in, in the brain hardwired. We're hardwired to deal with and respond to unpredictability uh, versus predictability. The brain is capable of responding to both, and it's hardwired to do that naturally, uh, despite what the left may tell you. Um, and so you put the rat in the cage and uh, explores the cage at first. It gets rid of the fear, that is to say, it, conquer, it through the exploration process, it translates the unknown into the known and becomes safe and secure and is now in a new environment in which it feels safe. And so that situation has been uh, successfully conquered. The mother has been successfully conquered in a certain sense uh, and translated into the realm of the father, into the realm of safety and security. Uh, but if you then... Fear can be learned, though, of course, if you, uh, through classical conditioning, electrify the floor and turn on a light. And every time the floor is electrified and shocks the rat and the light comes on, it learns to respond to that with fear, such that if you just turn the light on, it'll freeze without the shock necessarily having to be there. Uh, and so we know that we've taught it a new kind of fear. We've basically reset it back to its original inhibitory freezing anxiety that it felt when it first entered the cage. So we're reactivating that. So fear is, I think he's got a good point here. It's very definitely innate. He mentions the fact that there have been studies done on rats where um, rats who have previously never seen a cat before uh, will instinctively freeze the moment it, it sees the cat. It'll just freeze, even though it's never seen it before. But if you make incisions in the rat's amygdala, it won't freeze. And so that tells us then that uh, fear there is hardwired into the brain. There's an, what used to be called, this is, again, there's nothing new here. This, this, uh, this is, there were Russian studies, the study of instinct, I think it was by Nikolai Tinberg, if I recall, way back in the 40s or 50s, uh, a Russian uh, studied what was called innate releasing mechanisms, such that you could do, he was doing experiments with hawks and chicks, such that you could set chicks loose who had never seen a hawk before, and then you could, if they saw a hawk, they would freeze and they would stop. Or you could make a paper mache hawk and draw it over them and they would stop. So we know that the hawk is somehow, the image of the hawk is somehow buried in the nervous system of the chick. But if you take that paper mache hawk and draw it backwards, they'll keep going about their activities because they're used to the, the direction that a hawk naturally flies. Um, so there is such a thing as innate releasing mechanisms. He is on to something here that the brain is definitely hardwired uh, to experience fear of the new. Anytime a new situation comes in, you experience fear. But you have to get over that fear to then uh, take the crisis as an opportunity for expansion of knowledge and transformation in paradigms. Uh, so that's an opportunity for a paradigm shift. And uh, that's something that, um, you know, brings about the new, the matrix, the 
the unknown is the matrix of the new. And I think he's, he's dead on about this. It is the unknown that is the source for the growth over time of human knowledge, which gets larger and larger and larger. We know more about anything than anyone has ever known in history on this planet today because of the sheer accumulation that we have had of our knowledge systems. So he's definitely right about this. We know a lot more than we ever did know. However, I think that um, he doesn't get into it yet in this chapter, but I think the attribution of sexual valencies to this triad is a bit problematic and definitely is not hardwired into the brain or innate at all. Uh, the great mother, he associates with the unknown um, and the great father with the realm of the known. Okay, problem here. Um, the assignation of sexual valencies to phenomena is totally arbitrary. It is totally culturally arbitrary. Jungians, for example, uh, like to tell you that the moon is always female. It's inherently female. It's cloudy and moody and dark, and, and the sun is inherently male. Well, those are Jungians who haven't done their mythological history, <laughs> because as you go back through mythological history, you start finding the sun being associated with the female power, uh, the Hittites, for example, had a sun goddess. Uh, in German, the sun is die Sonne, it's feminine. Uh, the moon is der Monde, it's masculine. In French, it's the other way about. La lune is feminine. Le soleil is masculine. Uh, so there, you can't assign gender to phenomena like it's inscribed in the phenomena. So, uh, interesting thing here. Notice that he's uh, associating women, females, with the unknown the troublesome factor out there that is the source of fear, um, and men with the safety and security of the known. Um, that kind of indicates that he has a, a fear of women, doesn't it? Doesn't it give you the sense that there's he's projecting a fear of women out onto the realm of the unknown? There's nothing about the unknown that has anything to do with goddesses or the great mother. I can tell you that as a, I started out as a comparative mythologist absolutely no reason to assign that signifier to that signified. Uh, and likewise, there is no absolutely no reason whatsoever to assign uh, a masculine valency to the realm of what is known, although Lacan does. Uh, Lacan assigns the realm of the known, the big other, as he calls it, to the name of the father, society, the symbolic, the social order. He does give it a kind of a paternal valency as well. Uh, I don't think Jung did. I think for Jung or Freud, for, for Freud, uh, the social order was the superego, the realm of the superego. I don't think there was any sexual valency there. And that's the equivalent of Jung's idea of the persona, the outer mask you wear in society. No necessary uh, sexual valency there either. Um, but um, yeah, this is, this is a problem. And it's interesting because um, uh, if you look at, you know, I pulled up out of curiosity, I pulled up... Uh, uh, Peterson's birth chart. Um, astrology is interesting. It's another way of looking at phenomena. I pulled up his birth chart, and lo and behold, on it, you find a perfect opposition between Mars and Neptune. They're in perfect opposition, uh, with Saturn forming a right angle T square right in between them. So you imagine it as a T square with Saturn here and Mars here and Neptune over here. They're all at a 90 degree angle from each other. This is really interesting because uh, when people tell me there's nothing to astrology, uh, I beg to differ. <laughs> Saturn is associated with, in traditional, uh, both in mythology and in uh, astrology, with laws, with rules. In other words, with the realm of the known. That's his realm of the known. Neptune is associated with the watery abyss, uh, which is typically in mythology associated with the Great Mother. It is out of Namu. Uh, the watery Sumerian goddess that on and Ki form the separation of the world parents. And Namu is the watery female abyss. So there's Neptune there. And Mars is the hero right there between them that goes back and forth between Saturn and Neptune, the known and the unknown. Interesting how those three archetypes resurface in his thinking in his basic triad here.